Well, we've done several messages today. We've done, we've done one on heaven, or not heaven, but hell. We did one on the near birth. And we've talked about different things as we've come through here, how God came down and became flesh to redeem us from ourselves, basically. Now, in our Bible readings today, this is class number 101. We're talking about a period of time when God called Abraham out right here in this period of time. Now here's Adam way over here. This is uh, the curse and death. We have the age of conscience. We have the flood. And what happened after the flood? Things dramatically, the earth dramatically changed. How did it change? The animals started eating meat. The animals started eating each other after the flood and man began to eat animals. What else happened to the earth itself? Well, and people. It divided. The earth was divided in that time and continents began to form. Yeah. Okay, and then what else? The water vapor canopy disappeared. The water vapor canopy, canopy disappeared. Okay. Life expectancy is much shorter. And the languages of the people were yeah. greatly confused. The languages were confused at the Tabel Power of Bible, and then the people spread to where they could understand each other, and then God began to divide the earth. Where they were is where they stayed. How the American Indian got here on this land? When the earth was divided, they were here. They were already here, yeah. They were already here. If you ask the American Indians, they say, we were already here, always here. We didn't get here, we were here. And we find out that yeah, the American Indians are not Jews, are they? No. As the Mormons and uh, the, uh, say that we are, we're not Jews, we're not to the, the lost ten tribes, we're Asian is what we are. We're Asian. If you knew me when I was young, I had slanted eyes, looked just like I was Oriental. My family all looked that way. They were very high blood Indian. The high blood Indian is going to have Asian eyes because we're Asian. Simple as that. Uh, Asians don't have much facial hair or body hair at all, do they? Neither do American Indians. The Jews have plenty of hair, don't they? <laughs> lots of facial hair and, and lots of lots of hair, bald heads too. Now I'm bald headed in my old age too, nearly. But a lot of that was caused by chemotherapy and radiation also. It never did return. Well, all of this happened in this period of time. Then Abra God calls Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees, which was a bunch of pagans. And Abraham was born within a short time of Noah's death, wasn't he? They knew each other all this, but they, were, they had become pagans in the land of Babylon, basically, the Ur of the Chaldees. And that was a greatly advanced civilization at that time. They had banks, they had locks, they had uh, money, they uh, had libraries. And Abraham was called out of that advanced civilization, so to speak, to go to a land they didn't know, know anything about it. He got as far as Haran. And he got up there and he wasn't going to go any further until the Lord called his family a little bit more. And he ended up with just himself and Lot in tow. And Lot was his brother's son. And Lot was a, he was a saved man, but he was ungodly buzzard, wasn't he? And he went down, to they, their families uh, went back into the land of Canaan, they went down into Egypt, <clears throat> went down into Egypt, and, and Abraham was a used wife salesman. You've heard of a used car salesman? He was a used wife salesman. So he sold his wife to Pharaoh, and, uh, and Pharaoh, uh, God spoke to him and told him, I'm going to kill you, that's my prophet, turn him loose. Get him, get his wife back and get out of here. And then Pharaoh says, take everything you got, everything I gave you, and get out of here. And take my daughter with you too. Because he was supposed to marry Pharaoh's daughter, which was Hagar. He was supposed to marry Pharaoh's daughter, but he made a slave out of her and sent her. Princess of Egypt became a slave and a handmaiden. You know how that is, Marilyn. <laughs> you know what being a handmaiden is, don't you? Yeah. That's a slave. Uh, anyway, that's what she was. She went from princess to a slave. 
That was a political marriage, so to speak. Then he goes down and he goes into another area and he runs into a guy named Abimelech. Abimelech. What does Abimelech mean, remember? Well, it's a title. I know it's a title. It's a title. Rather than a name. I it means a father of the king. Mm -hmm. Father of the king. Yeah. So this is, this is the king. So what does Abraham do there? Same thing. <laughs> he sells his wife again. They're really, she was a pretty woman, so he sold her again. And then God speaks to Abimelech and said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> That's my prophet over there. That ungodly buzzard is my prophet. You send him away. And so he sends him away into the land and he tells him, this, whatever you want to do, just do it. Just leave me alone and take your wife with you. And, act her, and let her act a little bit more like a lady, okay? Let her act a little bit more like a lady. Let her dress like she's married. That's what he told him. This is Abimelech telling him how to make his wife dress, okay? So, now we go on. And God separates Lot from Abraham because Lot was not a good... <clears throat> He wasn't good baggage. God had to change his life a little bit and just get all this dross out of his life. So he did. <clears throat> now, we got Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities around Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, this little book right here, the book, the ancient book of Jasher, and it says, Safer ha Ashur. Sefer Ha'ashur, that means the scribe Jasher. The scribe Jasher, that's what it means. In this book, it tells you a lot about Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the five cities. And this was a bad place. They killed people. They, they hijacked people. They murdered people. They tortured people. One of Lot's daughters, according to the book of Jasher, uh, she tried to help a stranger come to and she fed him, and they were trying to starve him to death. They tortured people. They put him in a room and wouldn't feed him. And he kept on staying alive. And they found out she was giving him food. So they take her out, and they cover her with honey, and they set the hornets and bees after her. Mm. Slowly she dies of stinging and bites. Mm. This is one of the lost daughters. Then he had two more also. And he had a wife. Well, anyway, that's what's going on around here. And the only thing about it now, let's go and see what God says about this area here. It came about in the days of Araphel, a king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Elasar, Shedelmar, king of Elam, and Tidal, a king of Goim. That they made war with Merah, the king of Sodom, and with Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, the king of Admah, and Shemagar, the king of Zebuin, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And all these came as allies to the valley of Sidon, which is the Salt Sea. That's down by the, down by the Dead Sea now. Twelve years they had served Chadlamar, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Chedalamar, and the kings that were with him defeated the Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and Zuzim in Ham, and Emam in Shabay Kiriothal. And the Horites in the in Mount Seir, and that's Petra. Down there where Petra is now. And by the way, Petra is probably where Mohammed was born, if he really existed. It, there was Mecca wasn't there simple as that. But now we have uh, Mount Seir, and everything if you've described in the Quran describes the area around Petra. It doesn't describe the area around Mecca. I just thought I'd throw that in there for good measure. And the Horites of Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is in the wilderness. And they turned back and came to in Mishpat, that is Kadesh, 
and conquered all the country and the Mal Malachites and all the Amorites who lived in Hazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of uh, Atma and the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zor, they came out and they arrayed themselves in battle against them in the valley of Sidon. Now we got a battle coming on here. We got a lot of powerful kings that have come in and they've come in and they've conquered everything in their way and now they're going to conquer all the kings of the five cities around the, the sea, the, around the uh, Dead Sea. Against Ched Lamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of Goim, and Amphrael, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now in the valley of Siddim, where there was a, it was full of tar pits. Now, by the way, the Bible is a real good archaeological and geographical book and geological book. My friend worked for George Bush with Marathon Oil Company, Walter West. And he went over there and they took the Bible and they said there's oil in this area. If there's tar pits in the Bible, there's oil. Where there's tar pits, there's oil. Or coal or whatever. And they went in that area and they drilled. And by the way, they drilled into this area and they drilled down deep. And they run upon, they did core drillings. And down hundreds of feet under the ground, they found pots and all types of living instruments, utensils, but it was full of radiation. Full of radiation. And Walter said, well, I wish I could show this to you, he said, because this is Sodom and Gomorrah, this is when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He used atomic power to do it. It was there, just exactly what this book says. It's all right there. Except we're a little bit ahead of that area, which is over later. Now, one thing they did wrong. All these kings, they did something wrong. Now, the valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, and the kings of the of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them, and those who survived fled to the hill country. This is like the La Brea tar pits. You've been there, I'm sure, the La Brea tar pits. This is like the La Brea tar pits, and there's a lot of oil down there in there, Maryland. Yeah. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply, and they departed. And the mistake was made. Now, here's the mistake. They could have got by with all this. But they did something really wrong. And they took also Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. He wanted to live. What what was his occupation? What was Lot's occupation? Well, he was he had herds. You know. What was his occupation after he went to Sodom? Oh, well, he was a judge. He was a judge and a lawyer. Now, how many good lawyers and judges have you seen? None. <laughs> no. Really? Yeah, I haven't found any yet? Not so far. The Lord said, I looked high and low and far and wide and I couldn't find any just, no, not one. Then in the future he came in and told Abram, the Hebrew, now he was living by the Oaks of Mamre. And the Amorite, and the brother of Eshcol, and the brother of Anar, and all these allies were the root of Abram. Now, Abram means what? Um, Come on, Abram, Abram. Okay, father of all. No, not fa exalted father. Exalted father, exalted father. That's what Abram means in Hebrew. He's going to give a different name later. He's not going to have, his name is not going to be Abram anymore. It's going to be Abraham. And when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men. Now, he had soldiers, he had generals. Abraham, as he goes through these countries and he keeps selling his wife, he gets getting richer and richer and richer and he gets more slaves and, and he trains these men in, in, in war. He's going to go after his relative. It's used as actually brother. Ahat is the word in Hebrew. 
had been taken care of and laid out his trained men, born in the hen his house, 318, 318 generals, trained warriors. Now, and he went and pursued as far as Dan. Dan and Beersheba, you know. And he divided his forces against them by nine, and he and his servants had defeated them and pursued them as far as Habal, which is in the north of Damascus. Now, we know where that is. Damascus is in Syria today. I've been there. I stayed a whole week. Actually, I think I th stayed 11 days in, in Damascus, Syria, the most backward country I've ever been in. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possession. And that was a problem they made. They should have left Lot alone. They could have taken all the stuff, but they took Lot. And they took the kings too. He brought all the goods back and he brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and all the women and all the people. Then after his return from the defeat of Shedelamar and all the kings that were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shabi. That is in the king's valley. And Melchizedek, Melchizedek, Melchizedek is a very important character in the Bible, even though we don't say much about him. Merriman's being bad. <laughs> <coughs> Melchizedek, king of Salem, Melchizedek, Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ himself. Now some people think that it was pre-incarnate Christ that Melchizedek was. Some people believe that. Whether that is true or not, anyway, he is a type of Christ. I can assure you of that. He had no beginning, he had no end. If you go to the book of Hebrews, it will tell you all about and use this type. Sheba, that is the King's Valley in Malachi, the King of Salem. Salem means, uh, that became Jerusalem later, King of Peace. Salem means Shalom, means peace. And he brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. Melchizedek is the priest of the Most High God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is our High Priest, our one and only High Priest. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the God of the Most High, and possessor of heaven and the earth, and blessed be the God Most High. Who has delivered your enemies into your hand and gave him a tenth of all. Now, the tenth means the Akri is the term, that's the term Akri, and that means they took everything out that they had and they put it in a pile. And the very best, the most jewels and diamonds, the most valuable things were right at the top. And that's called the tithe. That was given to the kings. The very best was given to them. That was one-tenth, but it was the very best. <clears throat> the best <clears throat> that were on top. That's kind of like the cherry on top of a banana split or something, Marilyn. Sharon, you like those cherries on top? That's exactly like it is the Akri. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abraham said, or Abram said, to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, Jehovah Elohim El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal or a thong or anything that is yours lest you say you should say that I have made Abram rich. Abram said, I don't want anything. I don't want anything. Now, people in this time when you went to war, booty was your wages. Did you know that? The booty was your wages. The soldiers were paid by what they could steal and what they took from other people. So let's see what happened. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the, of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their share. 
After these things, meditate, as it says in the New Testament, the word of the Lord, the word of Adonai, came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not fear Abraham or Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord, Adonai, Jehovah, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house, Eliezer of Damascus. Remember we talked about him a little bit earlier when we talked about hell and Sheol and paradise. Eliezer means what? Jehovah, our God, is helper. Lazarus means what? Helpless. Helpless. So Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given me no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Now, he had a wife, didn't he, already? He had two wives, actually, didn't he? And by the way, Abraham ended up with how many wives? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. He had a Shemite wife, which was... Sarah. He had a Hamite wife, which was Hagar. And what was the other one? Keturah. Keturah. And Keturah was a, was a Japhethite. All three races would come from Abraham now. And by the way, many people trace Alexander the Great from Abraham. Let one that is born in my house, let Eliezer be my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to them, saying, This man will not be your heir, but you, but one who shall come forth from your own body shall be your heir. Now, he's going to have a bunch of kids later on. He's going to have Ishmael. He's going to have... Uh, Isaac. What? Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. And then all the Keturah's kids. Yeah, all the Keturah's kids. He's going to have Isaac, which means laughter or pleasure. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have Ishmael, which means God hears. And he's going to have all these other kids by Hagar, which will populate all of Europe later on. One shall come forth from your own body shall be your heir. And he took out him outside and said, Now look toward heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall you be your descendants be. And that means his spiritual descendants. Then he believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him for righteousness. What a story. And the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you into this land to possess it. <coughs> and he said, O Lord God, O Jehovah Elohim, how may I know that you shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these things to him, and he cut them in, in two, in pieces. He, he lays one half the bird here, and the other half. One half the lamb here, one half the lamb. <coughs> now, this is really a weird covenant. This is barit, the covenant. A cutting. A covenant means cutting. And this cutting, they cut the animals in half, and they put them on like tablecloths or pallets on both sides, and then they would walk down between them, and they'd give one another the shoe. Give them a shoe. Because they'd walked in the shoe. They had walked in the shoe. Remember the old Indian story, don't condemn my brother, don't judge my brother, and he walked a hundred miles in his, in his moccasins. That's basically, this is kind of an idea, you give a man his shoe, and that was a very important article. That's what protected him. You give him a shoe. All right, he took the, he cut them in two and laid each side opposite each other, and he did not cut the birds, and the birds of prey came upon the carcass, and Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep, a hypnotic trance, hypnose, is a word in Greek, hypnose in the Septuagint, a, a hypnotic trance fell upon him, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know this for certain that your descendants will be a stranger in the land 
It is not yours, and where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. He's talking about the, here we are here now. He's going to talk about the Egyptian bondage, hundreds of years ahead. They're going to be there for 400 years in the land of Egypt. And why are they going to be in the land of Egypt? Because God, Abraham didn't believe God enough to stay there in the land of Canaan, so he went down to Egypt and said, because you went down there, your children go down there, and we're going to be enslaved for 400 years. You left there a king, basically, with well of wealth, your children go back there and they're going to become slaves. But I will also judge that nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. They sent them out there and sent them out with money, gold, silver, beautiful clothing, everything, to get rid of them. Take everything with you and leave. Bye. Go, don't come back. And as for you, you shall go forth from your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a great old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return from there, for the iniquity of the Amorite is yet not complete. Now the Canaanites in the land, they were going to possess the land. And back in Genesis, the ninth chapter, verse 24 onward, it says that the, the sons of Canaan, Ham's descendant, Canaan, would go into the land of God, and they were going to be servants to them. But God is going to take that land from them. And it came about when the sun had set. That was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven, flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. Jehovah God is passing between the pieces. God is going to sign the contract himself. Abraham was supposed to meet him in the middle, but Abraham's asleep. That's a type of our salvation. It's not by us or anything we do, but it is by God only. And the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants I will give in this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Gerades, and the Canaanites, and the Kerizites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is all yours, Abram. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you because these people aren't worthy to live in my land. I'm giving this land to you. A portrait of the power of God, His omniscience, His omnipotence, and His omnipresence. God, Abraham, wherever you go, I'm going to be with you. Now, even the, it, the land of Israel was occupied by foreigners for hundreds of years, and then May the 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again. And the reason why they became a nation again is some of the promises right here. Israel crucified the Messiah, but he set him aside for the whole church age, but he's going to bring him back into covenant relationship with him again because of what he said to Abraham and what he said to David. The, the Jewish, Jewish existence today hinges upon two things, the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant. That's it. God made those covenants. They were unconditional covenants. Your salvation is an unconditional covenant. It's like mine. We do nothing for salvation. We do nothing to keep it. But we follow our Lord. By faith we pray. And God protects us in every way. In every way. Our Father, we send this message out today. We know that you're there. We know that we live in an unjust, wicked world today. But you're with all of us. I pray for those that are out in foreign lands and Islamic worlds, especially where they're tortured and killed and abused terribly. I pray you give them the grace that they need where they are. And us today in this godless nation, I pray that you give us the grace to make the decisions that we need to. And Father, we thank you for your Son and the promises that you've given to us in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.